Hello, this is Dr. Jeffrey Miller from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, today I'm going to discuss alveolar focused orthodontics, visualization of limitations of orthodontic tooth movement through comb beam CT. This is part one of a five part series. My name is Jeffrey Miller. I graduated from Towson University, got my dental education at the University of Maryland, my orthodontic certificate at State University of New York at Buffalo. I've been board certified since 1991. I've been in private practice in the Baltimore, Maryland area for over 33 years. I'm a member of the Golden Circle of Excellence and I speak on comb beam CT topics related to orthodontics. If you take a look at the gentleman in the white t-shirt, how would you assess his behavior? Would you consider his behavior to be normal? He's sitting next to a bronze statue. Well, your assessment's based on a two-dimensional photograph. If you had the, abil the ability to walk around this gentleman and see him from behind, you would see that he's wearing a Bluetooth earpiece. And that's uh, basically the difference between imaging with traditional cephalometric and panoramic x-rays, which are two-dimensional, versus three-dimensional imaging using comb beam CT. I'd like to go over just some basics about comb beam CT uh, that I think are relevant for this discussion. Comb beam CT uh, provides the ability to view through three planes of space. You have the axial view. If you notice the right and left axial view, uh, the you're looking as if you're standing at the patient's feet and the patient's right and left uh, correspond to the actual patient's right and left. Taking a look at the coronal view, same thing, you have the patient's right and left and you have the sagittal view. As orthodontists we tend to bias the sagittal view. It's just one piece of the puzzle. When you look at the sagittal view of a tooth, for example here, you need to really look at all three planes of space to properly assess the bone support uh, of that tooth. And you see here, you get a different perspective from the axial view than you may from the sagittal view. Also, you should be mindful of what the pulp chambers look like. You see here from the axial view, there's no distortion of the pulp chamber as there is in the coronal view. The reason there's no distortion of the pulp chamber here is because we've made compensations for the angle of viewing to eliminate that distortion. When we compare it to a cephalometric x-ray, a cephalometric x-ray is really just a composite view that has lots of overlapping structures. So for example, if you want to know how much bone support or the limitations of tooth movement of the lower right central incisor, it's really impossible to tell because you're looking at the cuspid, the lateral, the central, the central, the lateral, and the contralateral cuspid with all the bone overlapping each other. You can't tell what's going on on an individual tooth basis. Now in this particular cephalometric x-ray. This is post-treatment. The teeth are well aligned. But when you look at a cephalometric x-ray pre-treatment and you have teeth that are overlapping, it really compounds uh, that inability to look at individual teeth. With comb beam CT, you can eliminate superimposed structures and see exactly the two, a single tooth with its supporting bone take a look at this patient. Uh, this patient, uh, this is uh, you know, five or six years post orthodontic treatment. This patient came into your office for some very, very minor alignment of those lower incisors. Would you hesitate to provide orthodontic treatment? Well, this on, based on this PANSF, obviously there's some issues there, but how significant are they? Well, if you had the ability to slice through the lower central incisor and eliminate all of the superimposed structures so you can get a clear view of that one individual tooth, this is what it would look like. And would that make a difference 
in your uh, motivation to treat this patient, it could. Whenever I show slides like this to orthodontists, they say, well, you're not accounting for the bone that's burnt out from the radiation or the bone that should be there that you can't see uh, uh, because the image uh, doesn't show that bone. Well, uh, I'm not sure, I, and I, uh, I buy that theory. I just don't believe it makes that much difference clinically. Well, here's a slide I got from Gerald Nos Nelson. Uh, Dr. Nelson is the... Uh, head of the orthodontic department in San Francisco. Uh, it showed this unfortunately as a 19 year old girl that was tragically killed in an automobile accident and this is the dry skull section from her autopsy result. And you can't tell me there's that much difference between the dry skull section and the comb CT of that section. Now, studies show that the dry skulls or uh, comb CT are extremely accurate when you start getting into live patients, that's where you get uh, the variation of where you know the bone starts and stops. But I still don't believe it makes that much difference clinically. You know, we're looking for, at the bony housing, and we're looking for limitations to orthodontic tooth movement. Um, you know, half a millimeter here or there doesn't make that much difference. Also, when the image was taken. Is, is really important. You know, as orthodontists, we're in a unique situation because we're moving teeth. The teeth, we're, we may be taking progress uh, images while the teeth are in trans transition. So here's a case where there was a lingually locked upper lateral incisor. This was pre treatment. This is a post treatment. And you can see from uh, the pre treatment and post-treatment images that you what happened is pretty much exactly what you would expect to happen as the lateral incisor came facially through this little bit of clefting or you'd expect a little bit of dehiscence there and that's you know what you see here however in this particular patient we took a progress comb CT and here you can see as the tooth got tipped forward there you don't see very much bone on the lingual. From the axial view, you see it looks like it not only dehisced from the lingual, it looks de dehisced from the facial as well. So it's important to know the time frame you're taking these images relative to the tooth movement. Combe CT also uh, can be deceptive if you don't know what you're looking at. For example, here's a case this is a one and a half millimeter focal trough. You can see where the cortical plate is relative to the facial aspect of the root. And we blow that image up. It's a little clearer. Here's the alveolar process. This tooth has been pushed through the limit of the cortical plate and here is the facial aspect of that root. But if I widen that focal trough to five millimeter, this is the same patient. With a wider focal trough, that tooth looks much more centered within that alveolar process. So you got to know, you know, where the slice was taken as well as the focal trough. With the 3D reconstruction, these are all of the same patient. Uh, the patient on the, the image on the left looks much different than the image on the right. Uh, you can make adjustments to these 3D reconstructions to make them look like, a, you know, whatever you want them to pretty much. This is actually a fairly accurate representation for, for this particular patient. But these are not, these 3D images are really not diagnostic. You really need, need to look through the individual slices. Here's that same patient. This is a reconstructed cephalometric x ray. You can see how this looks a little bimaxillary protrusive. Look at the difference of that same exact image using different settings. And you can see the pa this, although it's the same patient. This looks much more, I guess, within normal limits than, than this image. Here's that same patient, 3D reconstruction. The contrast and the intensity have been adjusted. And this is, makes this case look even worse. It looks like there's furcation involvement. And, and as you look through the slices, these molars are actually pretty healthy. The, the problem is from first bicuspid to first bicuspid. 
also the position of the slice here this slice you can see this yellow line is taken near the crestal bone if you take a look at the lower right lateral incisor uh, you see a little bit of dehiscence there but it's not too bad you take that same tooth and you slice it down closer to the apex you can see how uh, this is dehisced through the cortical plate compare the two you look like you're looking at two different situations thanks for listening uh, I hope you enjoyed this part one I'm um, gonna have part two up shortly